Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer as we invite the teacher of the Holy Spirit, who is the Holy Spirit. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, this day, we honor you above all else, God. You're our Heavenly Father, and we're grateful for the many blessings that you poured out in our lives. God, you are good, and your mercy endures forever, Lord. And so we're thankful this day, God, and we honor you as our Heavenly Father. We love you, Lord. And today, as we open up your word, God, we pray that you open it up to us. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear, hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our lives. Holy Spirit, come. You're welcome in this place. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us the vision and the wisdom, the direction, the instruction, even the correction we need. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are both preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet, God, there are brothers and sisters, Lord. No time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your kingdom, building your house, God. And so we thank you that this day, God, that you bless all the churches, bless the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel and Harvest Oak Valley, for the well on the way, for Ecclesia, Trinity, Emmanuel, Baptist, God, all the great churches that are out there, too many to name, God. Thank you for the Foursquare and the Assemblies, God. We thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord. If they're naming Jesus as Lord this day, God, we pray that you bless them as you bless us. Jesus, mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say... Amen. Today, as you get your Bibles out, go with me to the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. We're going to take a look at some verses there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. While you're turning there, uh, for those of you that are just joining us, last year we started a process called Freedom for Our Future. What that is, is a capital stewardship campaign. You say, what is a capital stewardship campaign? Campaign. Well, capital meaning money, stewardship meaning management. So we are in the process of a money management campaign. What are we doing that for? Here's the reason why is because we have this building that we got into this building, and in order to get into this building to reach more people, we needed to build, we needed to grow, we needed to develop. And so we had this building that we got into. Now, with that building came a mortgage. And that's okay. You know, we're paying our bills, we're doing what we need to do. But it came to our attention as we were looking at what we're doing, how we're doing it, that there are some restrictions on us with that mortgage. Now, first of all, we we found out that we needed freedom for the next generation. We did not want to leave a financial burden or a debt to the next generation. Therefore, we needed to retire, not just pay down, but pay off the mortgage on this building. Additionally, when we took a look at the things that were happening, we saw that the Bible says that the borrower is slave to the lender. Therefore, we didn't want to be in that position. We didn't want the bank to have the ability to call the note. And we, if we didn't have the money, they could take this tool from us because that's all this building is. It's a tool to reach people for Jesus, to, to house the real church, which is the people. And if they called the note, we're all meeting in the park next week, and that's only going to last for so long. You hear what I'm saying today? And so we don't want a bank to come in and tell us how we're going to do things, what we're going to do. We don't want them to take this from us and give it to, uh, you know, somebody who's going to turn it into a mosque or into a shopping center or something ungodly like that. This is going to be a witness and a testimony. It's a stake in the ground of San Bernardino saying that God is real, that Jesus is Lord, and we're going to proclaim him from this pulpit until Jesus comes. But we need to be free from this mortgage debt to do that. Next thing we looked at, we said, well, you know, there's more ministries. I mean, when I take a look at the $87,000 that we're paying in a mortgage payment every month, I I get angry on the inside. Why? Because there's interest in that. No, I don't mind paying for what we bought. I don't mind paying for the building. That's fine. But when I take a look at interest, and when I look at what we're paying over the long term in interest, lining the pockets of a bank, I get mad. Why? Because there are people out there that need to hear about Jesus. There's an inland empire that needs to be reached. The goodness of God should be going forth, and we need to be able to finance the gospel, finance the good works. We need to be able to reach people around the world, not just here in the Inland Empire, but how many more missions could be funded? How many more churches could be built? How many more people could be reached? How many more, uh, you know, different things could we do? The diversities of ministries, and we don't need the limits of finances on us. We need to free up finances so that we can do more ministry. Now, as we took a look at this, we realized that there was another freedom that came along with all this, that as we got free in all these other areas, free from this financial burden that was on us, that there was a freedom that took place, which is the most important one of all, freedom for our hearts. 
That as we got out from underneath that bondage and that yoke from money, that now all of a sudden our hearts could be free. We could be free to serve the Lord, be free to move, and free in faith, and free in the things of God. Now, we've already heard this year about the pressure associated with finances. All of us have that pressure on us in some degree or another. But we should be taught on stewardship and finances for a reason. Because why? Our hearts, remember this is the most important heart, our hearts are often tied to our money. So much so that our money can actually be a master to us. And we realize that are we going to let finances tell us what we're going to do or are we going to let the Lord tell us what to do? Because you can't serve both God and money. Either you're going to love the one and hate the other or you'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. And therefore, it's such an important thing for us to get free from finances and to serve the Lord. Now, last time we were together, we also saw that this is so neat, 15% of what Jesus taught on throughout the Gospels was finances and material possessions and wealth. Okay, So I started thinking about that, and I took a look at the the number of verses in the Bible that talked about finances in general, and then I divided that into the number of verses total in the Bible. And it's so cool because the the number is almost the same. It's 13 point some odd percent that the Bible speaks on finances, money, possessions, and wealth. So when I look at that, sometimes people say, well, why why would church want to teach on finances? Why would church want to talk about money? I mean, you know, there's so many other more important things like salvation and love and kindness and all that kind of stuff. And I would say an amen, and I would say, you're absolutely right. There are weightier matters of the law. There are weightier matters of the gospel. There are weightier things that, you know, we want justice and goodness and all those kinds of things. But if we don't teach on finances, then we're omitting 13% of what the Bible has to say. Now, let me ask you something. If I took away 13% of the nutrition of your body, how well would you be? If I took away 13% of your organs, how healthy would you be? If I took away 13% of your heart, how healthy would you be? See, we understand these things in the natural, but then we say, oh, no, we, we shouldn't talk about that in church. That's not as important. But listen, you work 40-plus hours a week to get finances that you're going to use throughout your week. So would God not care about 40-plus hours of your week? Would God not care about what you're using in your life? Would God just say, oh, that's not important? No, God is interested in every area of your life. And that's why we're teaching on finances, teaching on stewardship, teaching on prosperity, teaching on wealth, teaching on our hearts, because the heart is the most important part. And we don't want our hearts tied to money. We want our hearts tied to the Lord so that we can be free. Are you listening today? See, when our hearts are in the right place, we're able to get free from that pressure of money. Now it allows us to be something, and it's one word called generous. Generous. In fact, the title of today's message is Freedom for Our Future, Free to be Generous. Last time we were together, we ended with these verses. If you remember 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, we're going to take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 5 through verse number 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse number 5, says these words. It says, Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Now, let me set the stage for those of you that don't know about this section of Scripture. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. There has been a famine in Judea, and the churches of Judea are are having a struggle. They're having a hard time. And so the apostle now is going around to the Gentile nations, to the Gentile churches, and he is raising funds to send relief and aid to the churches in Judea and Jerusalem. So when he goes to Macedonia, he comes to the Corinthian church, he comes and he finds them and he says, there's, there's a need that's going on over here. And they get excited and they say, well, we want to give, we want to help out, we want to supply, I'll give this much, you know what, I'm going to do this, I, I, I've got something I'm going to give over here. And they really get excited and they really have this abundance that they're promising to bring. So the apostle gets excited, he goes around to the other churches and he says, hey, when I was over there in Corinth, you would not believe what's going on over there. These guys are excited, they're prepared, they're planning, they're going to be a blessing. What are you going to do? And so these other churches are saying, well, they're excited, they're, we're excited. I mean, this is so cool, this is wonderful. Let's give, let's be a blessing. And out of even their poverty, they were able to give. So he goes on in the next verse. And he says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap 
bountifully. Verse 7, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, why was he saying these things? It's because he was going to show up in order to receive the offering that they had promised one year ago. And he didn't want to show up and have them say, oh, you're here for the offering we promised? Oh, man. Doggone, I did say I was going to do that. Okay, well, here you go, you know. And then, and then they're giving out of a grudging obligation, not out of that same cheerful heart. See, sometimes when we get away from things, uh, we don't remember what God did in our life. We don't remember the things that we had promised. We don't remember what God had in store for us and the excitement and the passion that came along with it. And therefore, it's now no longer out of a true heart. Now it's out of grudging obligation. And in verse number 6, it says, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. But he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. I love that about God. You know, it's never like any sort of middle ground, take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You know, there is no, no like, you know, you can have the world and have God. You can't. No, listen, there is no middle ground. It's either is or it isn't, right? You're either all in with God or you're not with God. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me, right? God is just that way. You see in the book of Revelation, what does he say? He says, I wish that you were either hot or cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. That lukewarmness is distasteful to God. And so he says, in your giving, in your generosity, I want it to be the same way. Either you are or you aren't. Can I put it to you in San Bernardino terms? Either you is or you ain't. <laughs> Hello. It's like me talking to my kids sitting there in the living room, and all of a sudden the door flies open, kids go running out to play on the playground. What am I yelling at them? Shut the door! Why? Because in or out, pick one. You can't have both. Listen, I'm not spending my money and my air conditioning to, you know, cool down the entire world for you. You can either be outside where it's hot and you can play on the playground, or you can come inside the house and enjoy the cool air, but just pick one. Some of my parents out there can say a hearty amen to that. Verse number seven, he comes along and says, so let each one give as he purposes where? In his heart. See, that's what this is really all about. It's not about a dollar amount. Because you may have a heart to give, and in your life, all you can give is that 10. All you can give is that 100. That, that may not be a lot when you take a look at your neighbor and you say, well, man, they're probably giving 1,000, and all I got is this 100, you know? But listen, if your heart is in it, and that's a big thing to you, then that's a bountiful gift. Why? Because you're giving it with your heart. You're giving it with your life. You're giving it with your joy and your experience, and you're saying, God, I want to do this. God, I want to be involved. God, I'm excited about this. God, I, I heard about it, and now I want to fulfill it, Lord. And that's a bountiful gift. But, but on the other hand, if you're over there thinking, well, you know what, uh, geez, I guess since this is my church and I go here, I guess I've got to get involved. I, I guess I should do something. And it's a grudging obligation or a necessity. That's, that's not really there. That's a sparing gift, you know. You're saying, oh, I guess I'll give 1000 when really you could give 100000 And you're kind of sitting back going, well, you know, that's, uh, I'll just throw them a bone. You know, that way the preacher doesn't look down on me or think that I'm not involved or think that I'm not in this. But see, that's a sparing gift. He who so sparingly will also reap. Sparingly, he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. So let each one give, how? As he purposes in his heart. If our hearts are free from finances, from that bondage, then now it's no longer a grudging obligation. Now it's a joy. It's a generosity. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for look at this, for God loves a cheerful giver. Isn't that awesome? Do you want to be one of the ones that God loves? See, I, I know in my life I do, and that was underwhelming, by the way. I'll just let you know that right now. We've got to get this thing going on because I want to be one of the ones that God loves. The Bible says you can't please God without faith. The Bible says you can't be pleasing to God without obedience. But the Bible also said God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants, and God loves a cheerful giver. Now you're starting to get it. See, that word cheerful up there, that word cheerful is a neat word in the, in the original language. It's hilarious. It really means where, where we get our word hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver. What does that mean? That means that you're so generous that when you give, it puts a smile on your face. That when, you, when you're there and, and you're praying about your offering and God puts a number on your heart, you just laugh. 
<laughs> God, that's so cool because that's what, that's what I was thinking, God. That, that's where I was at, Lord. And then when God ups it, when God doubles it, you say, whoa, God, isn't that just like you, God? You're an over and above. You're an Ephesians 3.20, super abundant God. And God, I just know that you're going to supply. God, I know you're going to do something. God, I just love this, Lord. That's the hilarious giver. And that's what God loves in our lives. So today, generosity. How does it work? How do we do this? What, what's going on with generosity? If we're going to be generous, if our hearts are going to be free from this earthly master called money, and we're going to allow God to be the Lord of our life, then we need to be like God because God's a generous God, in case you hadn't noticed. God, God is an abundant God. God is a God who gives. In fact, for God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly Father knows how to give the Holy Spirit, whatever you ask, see, to those who love Him, to those who ask of Him. So generosity, a couple of things we're going to learn about today, about generosity. First thing that I see in these verses that we just read, first thing is plan to give, plan to give. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 5, take a look at the terminology that he uses here, plan to give. 2 Corinthians 9, 5 says, Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you, what? Ahead of time. And prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. You, you hear the words that are coming out? He's saying, I, I, you previously had planned you were to be prepared beforehand that it may be a matter of generosity, it may be ready. See, when you have a plan to give, then when you are being a good steward, then you can give what you have. But you can't give what you don't have. you got to be prepared to give. As a good steward, God's going to bring opportunities into your life. Maybe you've ever prayed this prayer, Lord, use me. Anybody prayed that prayer other than Pastor Dan? Want to be used by God? And God is saying, okay, every area of your life, not just in telling somebody about Jesus. You can tell somebody about Jesus. That's great. Be ready. We need to be ready to have an answer to those who ask. We need to be ready to preach the gospel. We need to be ready to pray for people, ready to be used in miracles, signs, wonders, healings, gifts of the Holy Spirit, those sorts of things. That's all great. But what about in the area of our finances? Are we ready to be used when the church says, hey, we're going to pay the building off, or we're going to go and we're going to build, or we're going to do this project, or we're going to support missions, or we're going to do something like that? What are we ready to do? If somebody has a need in the church, you know, the Bible says in the book of Acts, they supplied for the needs of others around them. Everybody shared in what good things that they had, breaking bread from house to house. See, are we prepared in our financial realm to be able to give? Are we stewarding? Are we properly laying aside so that when God says, I have a need, you can say, God, I'm ready for it? See, sometimes we see that as unspiritual. We think about planning as unspiritual. Well, wait, pastor, I don't want to plan my gift. I don't want to, you know, set aside. I don't want to calculate. That, that's not spiritual. That's not what God... See, we think it's going to happen like this, right? Here we are in church. The pastor's preaching and talking about, you know, finances, talking about the financial stewardship, capital stewardship campaign. And we're supposed to have a number on our heart, right? And so we come into the church, and so we're waiting. We're saying, Lord, I need to hear from you. God, I, 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 I'm praying, God, I, I need to know a number. And God puts a verse on our heart, Jeremiah 29, 11, 29, 11, 29, 11. What does that mean, 29, 11? Why, why would God put that verse on my heart? I wasn't reading that verse. I wasn't thinking about that verse. But the preacher is preaching. He didn't say that verse. But I got 29, 11 in my heart. Suddenly the wife says, well, what do you think? And she says, I don't know. I, you know, God just put 29, 11 on my heart. And she says, that's so crazy because yesterday we got a check in the mail. And that check was for two. $2,911, and we say, glory to God, look how spiritual that is. And yet God doesn't operate like that oftentimes. Oftentimes it's because you sat down and you said, well, God, here's what I have in my hand. God says, great, I'm going to use that to deliver. I'm going to use that to save. I'm going to use that. I'm going to increase that. That's a seed. As you sow that seed, I'll bring increase into your life. So cool, just yesterday, one of the brothers was talking to me about their gift, and they were saying, you know, Pastor, you know, I, I was praying about it, and, and, and I was planning, looking at what I had, and, and God put a number on my heart that was a generous number. But it, it wasn't so much that it scared me away, you know what I mean? And he says, and, and so I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to start planning, start preparing. My, my wife and I, we started getting things in order, as we did. In one year, we've already fulfilled that commitment, and now we're looking forward to the next two years. See, it's not unspiritual to plan. In fact, Jeremiah chapter 29, 11 says, this is God speaking, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. See, if God is the spirit and God is planning, then it's very spiritual to plan. 
Very spiritual to prepare. Very spiritual to be ready so that it's not a grudging obligation. It's not a uh, necessity. I guess I have to do it. But now it's a matter of generosity. Are you listening today? I like this quote by a guy by the name of Vernon McClellan. He said, when it comes to giving, some people stop at nothing. Let it sink in. Some of you guys will get that tomorrow. It's okay. You want me to say it again? When it comes to giving, some people stop at nothing. Isaiah 32. Isaiah 32. Turn there with me. We'll just skip the jokes for today. It's okay. Isaiah chapter 32. Great verse in the Bible. It's talking about evil people who are just wicked and they're, they're plotting and they're planning their wickedness. God contrasts that with the righteous. Isaiah chapter 32, verse number 8. Take a look at it with me. Look at what it says. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 8 says, But a generous man devises generous things, and by generosity he shall stand. Look at that. A generous man. Everybody say a generous man. Oh, come on. Everybody say a generous man. Everybody say that's me. See, we're coming into the house of God to let God work on our hearts to get free from money so that we can become what God has called us to be, generous. You say, but pastor, I'm not a man. I'm a whoa man. Well, yeah, you're still a man. It's okay. You know, ladies, in case you didn't know, you're the sons of God in Christ Jesus. That's okay because the men have to deal with being the bride of Christ. You know, we're still trying to get over that and get, get through that and figure that out. But a generous man devises generous things. A generous person is scheming their plot and their planet. And look at this. And by generosity, he shall stand. I love that. By generosity, he shall stand. As you are generous, you're going to be able to stand. See, we have this thought in our minds that if I give, I won't have. You know, if I give away, then I'm not going to have enough for myself. But that brings us to the second thing, because when you plan to give, when you start being generous, secondly, prepare to receive. If we're going to be generous, not only should we plan to give, but we should prepare to receive. See, there's a spiritual principle that takes place that cannot be broken. Why? Because God spoke this spiritual principle into being. And God cannot lie. Therefore, when God says that whatsoever you shall sow, that shall you also reap, right? So the spiritual principle is this. As I'm generous, if I sow generosity, I'm going to reap what? Generosity, right? If I sow finances, I'm going to reap finances. If I sow love, I'm going to reap love. Now, okay, in the natural, we understand this principle. That when you sow one seed, do you get just one seed back? No. You get seeds in a greater measure, right? So if an ungodly, worldly farmer knows this principle in the natural, how much more should the church of Jesus Christ understand this principle in the spiritual things? It works in the positive as well as the negative. You see it in the Bible where God says those who sow the wind will inherit the wind. No, the whirlwind, right? The tempest and the storm. He who troubles his own house, right, will inherit the wind. So if you're going to sow trouble, you're going to get trouble, but you're not just going to get trouble. You're going to get trouble in a greater measure. In the same way, if you sow generosity, you're going to sow a certain amount, and that same amount will come to you, how? In a greater measure. I love this quote. I forget who said it, but he said, you can count the number of seeds in an orange, but you can't count the number of oranges in a seed. See, that's, that's where our generosity should be. That's where our sowing should be. We should understand that, you know what, as I'm generous, I don't have to worry about not having. By my generosity, I will stand. So as I sow, I know that it's going to grow, and I know that I'm going to reap in a greater measure. Why? Because the principle of God cannot will not, not come to pass. That was a whole lot of knots, right? What did Jesus say? He said, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men pour into your bosom. See, it's not just a, oh, I guess I'll just do a little bit and get a little bit back. No, God says there's a spiritual principle that takes place in our lives. Turn me to the book of Proverbs there in Isaiah. Book of Proverbs, you'll never lose when you're generous. Proverbs 
a couple pages back from Isaiah there. If you hit the Psalms, turn around, come back. Proverbs chapter number 11. If you hit the table of contents, you went way too far. Proverbs 11. Thank you, by the way. I needed that laugh on the last joke. My goodness. <laughs> Proverbs 11:25. Take a look at it with me. Look at the word of the Lord today for us. Look at this. The generous soul will be made what? I'm sorry. The generous soul will be made what? I didn't write this. God spoke this. Preacher, you shouldn't be talking about money. Why not? God does. I'm just following his lead. I'm following his example. Well, you're one of those prosperity preachers, aren't you? Yeah, so is the Apostle Paul. Did you read the book of 2 Corinthians there? He's talking about money, talking about finances, talking about sowing and reaping. Why shouldn't we? You think we want you broke down, busted, and disgusted? I want you to be a failure in life? No, I'm your pastor. I love you. I want you to succeed. I want your family to be blessed. I want you to go further than your parents did. I want to see San Bernardino become a desirable place once again because we raised it up and we restored the waste place. Did. I want to see people being able to walk the streets at night, loving their neighbors, telling someone about Jesus. I want to see churches filled to the glory of God. That's what this is about. Generous soul will be made rich. That goes way beyond your pocketbook. That is the least. That is a servant. No, rich means children grow up serving the Lord. Rich means fulfilled in life. Rich means you're a witness and a testimony on the job. Rich means that you have and you are full. My goodness. Old King James Version says fat. Hello. New International Version says prosperous. Look at this. And he who waters will also be watered. Himself. What does that mean? That if you refresh others, then you yourself will be refreshed. Have you ever been generous? Have you ever blessed somebody and you walked away from that encounter feeling good? Anybody had that happen? You just feel like so excited. Like, my goodness, I know I gave them a huge blessing, but I felt like I was the one receiving, you know? Why? Because the generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. As you give, it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Not just talking about material things, but also if you refresh someone, you will be refreshed yourself. I had an experience here at the church a couple of weeks ago at the Good Works Expo. We were having a good time reaching out to people, inviting the community, inviting the church out. You guys, anybody here for the Good Works Expo? Wasn't that a good time? Yeah, so cool. So cool. We brought our children, and we had our children helping out, and they were helping out in the children's areas, watching over things, and, uh, you know, making sure that things were going on, and they had their little responsibilities and things that they were doing, helping out and volunteering there. And when it came time for the food distribution, we grabbed up our children and a couple that weren't ours, and we came over, and I don't know, they just started showing up. It was like, come on, kid, you're going. And so we walked over there, and, uh, and we started serving at the food distribution center. There at the food distribution center, we had the job, we were at the end of the line, you know, so these people are coming through and they got boxes, and they're getting vegetables and fruits and rice and drinks and, I mean, just all kinds of stuff. They were loaded down. Now, at the end of the tables where we were, and they had the miscellaneous items that we didn't have, like, a lot of, you know, so it was like a box of uh, beans or, you know, uh, a cake mix or, uh, you know, drinks or something like that, that we had, you know, a whole lot of miscellaneous, and they could come and they could just grab whatever they needed out of there, and, you know, oh, I've already got rice, so I'll take the beans, or, you know, I need some spaghetti noodles, so can I have those, you know, and so they're grabbing little individual items, and our job was to go into these big storage containers and pull those individual items out and replenish the tables as people were coming through. And so we've got our heads down. We're working. Our kids are working hard. They're crushing boxes. They're having a good time. And my son goes to my wife and he says, Mommy, everybody is so happy. Now, can I ask you something? What is that worth? That my son has an experience at church seeing people in need and us being generous and he sees on the faces of the people how happy they are. That you know what? Even though in their need, in their lack, that we're able to supply, and that that's not what this is about. It's not about having money. It's not about having possessions. It's about the joy that comes in serving and loving and giving and generosity. What's that worth? As I was handing food to people and helping people to their cars, their, their faces were just lit up. They were beaming. They were smiling. They were looking me in the eye, and they were saying, thank you. God bless you. Many of them had no clue who I was, didn't know I was a pastor on staff here. All they knew was here was somebody loving them, and they were responding, and I think I walked away more blessed than any of them ever did. 
Are you listening today? He who waters will himself be watered. As we get free, we can be generous. Love what Winston Churchill said. He said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Isn't that cool? We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Which brings us to the last one today. So if we're going to be generous, number one, plan to give. Number two, prepare to receive. And number three, I like this one the best. You can't outgive God. Oh, you cannot outgive God. It's fun to try. You ever played that game with God? Hey, God, listen, I've been prepared. I am ready. And you know what? I've been giving and receiving, but you know what? I got a bunch right now. And God, I'm going for the gusto today. Today, I grab the brass ring, my friend. God, I'm going all out. God, I am all in, Lord. And this time, I got you. And God says, oh, come on now. Let's go, right? And, and, and just when you think you got God, you realize, I ain't got nothing on God, man. Look at this. I, I, here I was thinking I had the upper hand finally, and, and, and all of a sudden God did something. God opened up a blessing. God opened up a door. God, God just touched me, and man, I'm just overwhelmed, God. That's what I'm talking about. You cannot outgive God. Whew. You there in Proverbs, turn back to the book of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, neat story in the Bible, talking about a guy by the name of Solomon. You know Solomon, King David's son, Solomon the wise. 2 Chronicles chapter number 9. And in 2 Chronicles chapter number 9, we find a story about Solomon and a lady who was a queen that came to visit Solomon. Take a look at it with me in 2 Chronicles chapter number 9. 2 Chronicles chapter number 9, look at this. Verse number one, it says this. It says, now when the queen of Sheba heard the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with hard questions. Having a very great retinue. Now, I didn't know what retinue was, okay? So I had to look up that word in the dictionary and find out what retinue was, okay? Let's, can we be honest in here? Preachers don't know everything, especially this one. So I had to look up the word retinue. You know what retinue was? I was shocked when I read it. It said in San Bernardino terms, it means she rolls deep. Shocking. I was just like, wow, that's amazing. Means she had people, she had servants, she had stuff. I mean, she just was coming in with all sorts of pomp. There, I could imagine there's like elephants coming through, you know, and, and you almost hear like the bass. Boom, ch -cha, ch -cha. And here comes the Queen of Sheba, right? All the servants are walking. They got a little limp going on, you know. And, and they're going in. And here she comes, and she's got gold. Listen, listen to it. She with great retinue, right? And, and look at what it says. Camels that bore spices, gold in abundance, precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. This lady came, and she had questions for Solomon. Verse 2, so Solomon answered all her questions there was nothing so difficult for Solomon that he could not explain it to her. Wow. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers and their apparel. Isn't that just like a woman taking a look at the clothes? And his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. In other words, she was overwhelmed. She just went, <gasps> <sighs> look at what she says. Verse number five, then she said to the king, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Verse 6, however, I did not believe their words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And indeed, the half of the greatness of your wisdom was not told me. You exceed the fame of which I heard. Next verse, verse number 7, happy are your men and happy are these, your servants, who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Verse number 8, blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on his throne to be king for the Lord your God, because your God has loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore, he made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. Just a quick side note. You wonder about the purpose of your prosperity. The purpose of your wealth and your blessing is right there. He made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. Everything that we have should be used God's will, God's way. Plain and simple, that is the purpose for the blessings in our life. 
is to bring about God's justice on the earth and to do his righteousness, his will, his way. Not just a position, but also a practice in our life. Look at the next verse. Next verse, verse number nine. Look at what she does. After she sees all this, she's overwhelmed. She does something. She responds. Now, verse number nine, and she gave the king 120 talents of gold. In case you're wondering, that's a lot. Spices in great abundance and precious stones. Now, now Solomon already had gold. Solomon already had silver. In fact, there was so much silver that the people had it just lying around on the streets. They, did, they regarded it like it was a stone, a pebble. You know, like I, I paid my driveway with silver. It looks nice, you know. And so that's just how they were. So he already had all this stuff. She gave him a bunch of stuff he already had. But then look at what it says. She brought something unique. It says, there were never any spices such as those the queen of Sheba gave to Solomon. She brought something special, something unique, something personal, something from herself. Never was there anything like this before. Now she gives this to Solomon and she brings him this special gift. Now the next couple of verses talk about some wood that she gave him as well and what he did with it and, and how he used it and all that kind of stuff. Look at verse number 12 though, okay? She's just given him these gifts. She's just opened up her heart. She's been overwhelmed. Now she responds by bringing a gift to Solomon. Look what Solomon does. Verse number 12, now King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all she desired. Tell me for a second, what is the desire of a queen? That's got to be some pretty big desires. But it doesn't stop there. Look at what this says. Whatever she asked. You guys getting a hold of this? Not just some of what she asked. Not most of what she asked. But whatever she asked. Look at the next couple of words. Much more. Than what she had brought to the king. So she turned and went to her own country. She and her servants. Now let me ask you a question today. Am I talking about Solomon and the queen of Sheba? No. The king obviously is the almighty God. And the queen, the bride of Christ, is the church here on the earth. And when you get an encounter with God, when you get in his presence, when you ask him your questions, and when God responds and speaks to you about everything that's on your heart, and when there's nothing too difficult for God, and when you see the order, when you take a look at the skies and the heavens declare the glory of God, when you look at the mountains and the trees standing tall, lifting up praise to God, when you start to look over the earth and how God has order and how God is spreading over the earth, and you see the glory of God, and you come into his house, and you hear his voice, and you touch his heart, and you're overwhelmed, and then you say, God, I want to bring you of myself. God, I want to give you a gift. God, I know that everything I have, you gave me any anyways, but God, here it is, and God, here's something unique to me, special to me. Here's my own spice, God. Here's my own life. This is special, God, and then God turns around. God smiles, and he looks at you, and whatever you desire, all you desire, whatever you ask, much more than you could bring to the king, he will overwhelm you. He'll open it up. He'll pour it out. He'll bless you because you can't outgive God. <laughs> Woo! Don't hold back. Don't fear being generous. Allow yourself to participate in this wonderful blessing. Being like God. You can't outgive God. You know, this is our second year of this Capital Stewardship Campaign. I believe it's time for second level faith. I believe it's time for second level giving. You know, next week we're going to have a birthday celebration. We're going to come together. Maybe you have not yet participated. That might be a good time to launch participation in the campaign. Whether that just be giving on a regular amount, whatever you can bring, that's cool. Maybe you say, well, I'm going to go home. I'm going to plan and prepare. Maybe you can set something aside, a special gift for next week. Maybe you want to take a look at over the next two years. What can I commit to over the next two years? What can I do? But also, partnering up with what I can do. I'll plan and prepare, but what, what can God do? When my natural gets in there, and I believe God, and God puts his super on my natural, God, what can we do together? What can I believe you for? Pray about those things. Plan and prepare. Next week, we're going to bring, uh, yes, our regular tithes and offerings. We need to do that to continue the work of the ministry here. But we're going to bring a special gift. We're going to launch into some great and mighty and awesome things. Some great words for next year. Perseverance. Endurance. Moving forward, pushing through. See, this is that time where we could say, oh, you know what, the, the pledges aren't up, and we don't know, and giving's down. On the... No, 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 no. See, we're not going to let the devil push us back. We're moving forward. We're pushing on, and we're going to press through. And in the next two years, this building will be paid off in Jesus' name.
Today, did you get something out of the word of the Lord? Come on, let's give God a great big praise. Woo! All right, thank you. Thank you guys for, for staying put. There's a bunch of naughty people that got up and left. So I want to talk to them too. They can hear me out there in the foyer on their way out to the parking lot. I got speakers there. You see that concrete bench next to you? Go ahead and have a seat. Let's talk because God wants to talk to you right now as well. I want to give uh, you guys an opportunity in a moment here, but I want to make sure that no one gets up, no one leaves during this time. Come on, give me a couple more minutes of your attention. I'll let you go. Sometimes people wonder how to get to heaven. They think, you know, well, there's no hell, so I guess I'll, I'll automatically make it to heaven. And I wonder how people get that idea because the Bible talks about hell old and New Testament. Jesus himself spoke of hell. Sometimes people say, well, Pastor, I don't believe that God would send people to hell. You know, I don't, I don't think God's like that, you know. But the problem is that we don't get to determine how God is. God is God regardless of what we think or say about him. He is who he is. And he tells us how he is in his word. Now, God is not mean-spirited. He's not some st sadistic maniac that takes pleasure when people go to hell. That's not God at all. God is loving. And the Bible says God grieves over the death of the unrighteous when people go to hell. God does not want that. And yet, God is loving and just, and therefore, he gives us the free will choice to choose while we're here on the earth with our lives, whether we go to heaven or whether we go to hell. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, you know, all roads lead to heaven, you know, I, and, and, and I see that God is loving, and uh, God opened the way with Jesus, therefore, you do whatever you want to do, I'll do whatever I want to do, the churches out there can do their thing, you know, and as long as we all stay true to ourselves, then we'll get to go to heaven. Do you know that I don't find that anywhere in the Bible, stay true to yourself, or all roads lead to heaven? That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. You can drive around the earth as long as you want, you will never make it. It's one way you're going to have to get there. In the same way, Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. It means it's God's heaven. We're going to have to get there God's way. One way you're going to get there. Jesus said it's a narrow way. There's few who find it. And wide is the way that leads to destruction. So if you want to head that direction, be my guest. And yet God is here today pleading with you, asking you, will you go there my way? Will you head for heaven and deny hell? Now, sometimes people think, well, if I'm just a good person, doesn't God let good people into heaven? I've been really good throughout my lifetime. My parents raised me in church, told me we were Christians growing up, took me to religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school, catechism class, hung a cross from St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or christened as a child, and you're attending church regularly. I'm, I mean, Pastor, I'm, I'm here in church right now. Don't you see me sitting here in front of you? And, and I've always thought of myself to be a Christian. And I, at my last church, I got involved singing in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? The problem with that thinking is you know that nowhere in the Bible? Nowhere. Check it out. Does it say your good deeds get you into heaven? That your goodness is what makes it with God? It doesn't work like that. In fact, your goodness compared to God's goodness, the Bible says like filthy rags going to get thrown out. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not going to make it there by being good. Not going to make it there by being raised in church or attending church. That's like saying you could sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. No, you're just a person sitting there in your garage, right? Same way you can't sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. doesn't matter if you're raised in church, go to religious classes, any of that stuff. And, and nowhere in the Bible do I see your church involvement gets you into heaven. Help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. Nowhere. Check it out. Your church involvement will not get you into heaven. It's not about your goodness that's going to make it. Now, sometimes people say, well, hold on a second. Not only have I been involved and attended and all that kind of stuff. You know, I know God. I know about Jesus. Celebrate Easter and sing the songs of Christmas every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor, Old and New Testament. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian because I know who God is? Well, the problem with that thinking is if you'd read your Bible, you know demons know who Jesus is. They're not Christians. If you read your Bible, you'll find the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up here at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is or being able to quote some scriptures or celebrate a holiday. Or rather, this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know our society, Hollywood, television, movies, books, the internet have made a mockery out of that. They've tried to define it as weirdo and crazy and all that kind of stuff. But let's not let society and movies and Hollywood and television and books and the internet describe what being born again means. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. We talked about this in the message today. God is looking for all of your heart and all of your life. Jesus said, when I come, I want to find you hot. 
or cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, what is lukewarm? What is that? Well, that's a little in, little out, little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Well, listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity just like this. One, two, three, bang! Clap my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands clapping together, just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence now. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Let's push past that embarrassment today. Let's get over that. Think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? And ever? No one's that dumb. Yet the devil thinks that you are. That's why he's trying to push you out of this today. I'm trying to push you into this. Why? Because I love you and I want to see the best for your life. God loves you so much he sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Now will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. Who should raise their hand in a moment? Well, if you've been running from God instead of to you, God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given him all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand in this place? If you're lukewarm, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up, acknowledging your need for Jesus. I'll see your hand, count it, put it right back down. We all love you. We're all excited for you. Man, we've all done this in one way or another, at one time or another. Now it's your turn. Will you give them all of your heart? Will you give them all of your life? All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television, in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, come on, put the burger down. Get ready to get your hand up. Online, wherever you're at, all over the world, God is watching. You can raise your hand right afterwards and then click the button on our homepage, Respond to God. Or if you see the blue button that says Respond to God, someone will lead you in a prayer right afterwards. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. All together on the count of three if you need to do this. One, two, three. Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you. Where else today? Where else today? There's two. There's three. God bless you. There's four up top. Gotcha. There's five over there. Thank you. On this side. On this side. Where are you at? Five. Where at? Help me out if I can't see you. Okay. There's about five wise people up top. Six. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? There's about six wise people. Anybody else real quick? On this side. Six. Seven up there. Thank you. God bless you. If I already saw your hand, you can put it down. But if I haven't yet, give me a little wave, okay, if that's you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? There's about six or seven wise people. Where are you at, number eight? You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, yeah, let's go for it today. You should. Come on. Come on, where are you at? Anybody else real quick? When I'm looking in your direction, just pop it up if that's you. You feel the tug on your heart right now? That's the Holy Spirit of God just speaking to you right now. Just respond by simply raising your hand. You're saying, yeah, I need to do this. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for about seven wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, all seven of you, if you're number eight, nine, or ten, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap, and a shout. Uh, if you're sitting next to somebody, nudge your neighbor, say, come on, friend, I'll go with you. All right, so get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies today, but we can't do that till we get you down here. So let's all stand and welcome them. You raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. You come right now. Just make your way to the front. Come on. Jesus, I believe Come on, come on, come on. Get your kids, Jesus, get your stuff. Get in the aisle and meet me up front today. You're the reason that I live. You can You're come too. This is your time. This is your moment. Breathe. Jesus, I believe. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. Come on down. Jesus, I belong to you. From the family rooms, you can bring You're your children the down. They'll remember this. Come on down. You're the reason that I breathe. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. We'll wait for you. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Anybody else, if you need to come, just make your way to the front right now. Come on down. You're the reason that I live. Hey, you guys up front. 
Look up here for a second. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, all right? Came to give God all your heart. Came to give God all of your life. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. See this guy waving at you? This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on, okay? He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, give you some free information, some free literature, easy reading, okay, that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then he's going to introduce you to a friend we have in the church here that we call a spiritual personal trainer. It's a program that we have to help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. He'll describe how it works, then I'll let you come right back out. Now listen, 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 listen. Let me make a promise to you guys. Give us one year of your life sitting under the teaching here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. Committed and consistent. As you do and you apply yourself to the things of God, you will be so blessed at the end of that year and for the rest of your life with the investment. Remember, you sow, you're going to reap from that. You will just look at your life and say, man, I am so blessed. I never knew it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right, so if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.